Well, happy Father's Day, everyone. Welcome to the CRM MVP podcast, episode number 107. Uh, this episode is being released on Father's Day 2021, at least Father's Day here in the U.S. I don't know if Father's Day is celebrated in different days, in different countries, at least Labor Day is. I grew up in South America. We celebrate Labor Day on May 1st, and uh, here in the U.S., it's on like September something, September 23rd, I believe. I don't remember exactly, um, but um, yeah, happy Father's Day, everyone. Uh, this episode today is going to be... I think it's going to be a lot of rambling back and forward, to be honest. I didn't even think of the best title for this episode. You know, I thought about naming it the father of Dynamics 365 Online because obviously that topic is going to be part of the show today. Um, and, you know, I, I, I really don't know after I finish recording this episode what this will be called. Uh, but the one thing that I want to that sparked kind of the idea for this episode was the overwhelming amount of feedback I received from episode number 105. And on episode number 105, for those of you who didn't listen to that or didn't tune in, I talked about potentially the end of the line for Dynamics 365 on-premise. And basically what I wanted to do was to present the evidence that I found online based on the product life cycle from other Dynamics 365 or Dynamics CRM on-premise versions. I think I went all the way back to either CRM 4 or 2011 or something like that. So like multiple, multiple versions, like some since version 5 all the way to version 9. And what we found out on that was that when it comes to, I think the final one that I reviewed that was available, or at least that I found, was the CRM 2016 slash Dynamics 365. If you guys remember, the CRM 2016 was version 8. And Microsoft, instead of releasing CRM 9.0 and calling that Dynamics 365 from Dynamics CRM 2016 to Dynamics 365, for some reason, they decided to release version 8.2. Everyone was kind of baffled about that. I, I don't know why they did that, but whatever. Version 8.2 was an upgrade to CRM 2016 and came with a new name, Dynamics 365. It also came with a new, I guess, more extensive, uh, maybe some will say more complicated way of licensing Dynamics. And well, a bunch of different changes were introduced. So if you look at the lifecycle page and you sort by Dynamics, you will find that the CRM 2016 version 8.2, which is also Dynamics 365's end of life cycle, is the beginning of the year 2026. I believe is January 13th, 2026. I don't have it in front of me right now, uh, but I believe that that is the date, if I remember correctly. Um, and that doesn't give us the customary, I guess, 10 years of extended support that we've been enjoying for the life cycle of the other products. It abruptly cuts it within seven years, I believe, instead of 10. And, you know, I speculated on that episode without knowing, of course, because like I said, it's, if it's... If it was on their NDA, if they had told us that, I, you know, that that episode wouldn't exist. But um, I went ahead and speculated that that would be the end of CRM on premise. So I got a bunch of feedback on that. Most of it was, you know, kind of in the shape of, I had no idea about this until you said it, um, and that feedback came from both consultant solution architects pros, basically uh, out in the in the industry and customers too. So a lot of customers listen to the show, on-premise customers, and they listen to that episode. And understandably, they were, you know, kind of baffled about the fact that for some reason, Dynamics 365 was, you know, kind of ending after, you know, by after seven years instead of 10, and, and people were concerned about that. But then another type of feedback came through, and that feedback was, well, that is just 8.2, but what about 9.0, the next version of it? You know, the funny part is that it wasn't very easy to find 
the life cycle for 9.0. I mean, I scoured the, the whole of docs.microsoft.com. I looked everywhere and I couldn't find this thing. I'm like, are they hiding this? Like, do I have to reach out as an MVP and ask for it? Like, is this like under NDA? Like, I, I don't understand why it's not a public thing, but I finally found it. I found the link to the Microsoft life cycle you know, agreement for Dynamics 365 9.0, which is the latest version that we have. And of course, those of you listening to this depends on when you're listening to this. I'm recording this on June of 2021. Some of you will say that technically the latest version is 9.1. Some other people would say that technically the latest version really is 9.2. It really depends on when you received the latest version and how quickly are you jumping on you know the bandwagon for the for the newest version and the reason why i say that is because the absolute latest version of dynamics on premise is 9.2.2 and if you want to get more specific is 9.2.2.1061.00128 all right it is a huge name uh, service update 21061 is the full name of it. And it will be released, or it was released, sorry, two days ago. Two days ago, it was released on the first station. And, you know, just to give you, I, I feel like this could be a whole episode or at least a video. And I should probably record this video. So if you feel that like you want to learn more about this, let me know. But a lot of people don't know that when Microsoft pushes updates, out there. So let's say a new version of Dynamics 365 comes out. They push updates um, based on what they call an update train. And this train has stations, just like a regular train. It arrives at station one, station two, station three, and so on. Now, I'm not going to go over all the details of what station one is and station two is. What I can tell you is that the vast majority of stations, not all of them, but the vast majority of stations this train rolls through is based on geography. All right. So I'll give you an example. On station two, which is, you know, the, the second station the train stops at, let's say. Upgrades get pushed to a bunch of places. What are those places? South America, Canada, India, France, the UK, actually not the UK, United Arab em United Arab Emirates, so UAE, South Africa, Germany, Switzerland. They all get the upgrade on station two. So before we actually get it here in the US, all these countries get an update. Now, every one of these stations, and this is why I, I don't know how much of this is public information, and I don't want to get into all those details until I get clearance for this, but all of these states, the, the reason why this is planned as a train and it stops in different stations is because if something goes wrong, they'll be able to pull it back before it affects the vast majority of customers. Now, of course, if you live in Canada, for example, or if you live in France, you might be thinking like, well... Am I like a guinea pig? Am I like, are you just testing this stuff on me to see if it breaks or like, what's up with that? Well, the vast majority of customers are outside this station, this group, right? So they push it into this, into these different regions to see how the update goes. And they literally just monitor it and see what happens. Now, sometimes, depending on the size of the update, like if it's a service update, something small, they'll push it into all the stations on like the same day. Like it's, you know, the same example with that latest, you know, version that we just talked about, um, you know, where, where they're pushing it to all these countries at the same time. But sometimes they stagger it. So like I'm looking at the latest release right now. And I'll put all these links on the notes of this of this podcast or this video. If you're listening on on YouTube, uh, you'll have the links in there so you can take a look. But um, they're pushing for service update twenty one zero five five on on the eighteenth, so June eighteenth, which was yesterday from the time I'm recording this thing. Um, the latest latest version was pushed on the seventeenth to the station number one. And again, I'm not going to disclose all the details on that because I don't know how much is NDA. 
Um, station number two, I'm just talking about what's publicly available online. And again, I'll put the links from docs.microsoft.com on that. Uh, on the 18th was pushed to, as I mentioned, South America, Canada, India, France, the UAE, South Africa, Germany, and Switzerland. And then station three received update 21054. So the update before the one that was pushed to all those uh, countries or regions. And that includes Japan, Asia Pacific. So like Australia and, you know, everyone there uh, on that area of the world. Great Britain, which I mistakenly said it was in station two. That actually part of station three and Oceania, which is basically the rest of Asia, if you, if you call it that way, outside of India, for example, which we talked about being on uh, station number two. So they're pushing it to, you know, Singapore. They're pushing it to everyone, basically, on that side of the world as part of station three. Now, again, by this point, because we're pushing for update number, you know, I'm just going to keep it with the last number, the last two numbers, update 54. OK, by this point, they have already pushed 54 through station number two and station number one by the time it goes to station number three. So they've had time to basically evaluate and see if something breaks on those other countries and regions and, you know, situations, let's just say. Um, and if that's the case, then they wouldn't push it into Japan, APAC, Great Britain, etc. right? Station number four is Europe. All right. So Europe received update number 53 on the same day. Station three received update 54. Same day, station two received update 55. So you see how they're staggering this thing. They stagger them again to make sure that if a region is impacted, they are impacted, you know, early. They can catch it early before they push it to like the rest of the world. Station number five is North America. So for me, for example, in my instance, I don't get that update for, you know, days or weeks, depending on what kind of upgrade they're pushing, um, because we're all the way to station number five. And believe it or not, there's station number six. And I can actually talk about this one because, again, it's public. But station number six is the final station. Sorry, the final station and comprises the government cloud, which is here in the U.S. and China. All right. So those are the last two places where Microsoft actually deploys an update. So on June 18th, which was yesterday, as I mentioned, Microsoft deployed multiple updates. They deployed update 51 in China and the government cloud, update 52 in North America, update 53 in Europe, update 54 in Station 3, which includes Japan, APAC, and Great Britain, uh, update 55 on Station 2, which includes basically everyone else, South America, Canada, India, France, etc., and then update 61. So think about that. 55 was on Station 2. 61 was deployed on Station 1. So station one is getting updates very, very early. Now, again, I'm not going to disclose the information of what makes station one, but I think you can figure that out. If you think about the types of environments that, you know, are perfectly suited to receive, you know, updates way before everyone else, you can figure that out. Again, I'm, I'm going to try to get clearance from Microsoft so I can, you know, detail all this stuff. And I feel like a video will be the perfect way to do this uh, or at least podcast and video. So anyway, all of those releases are coming. Now, those are online releases, right? They're not available on premise yet. The latest one that is available on premise is 9.1. So 9.1 was pushed out basically on June 7th of this year. So that was, I don't know, 12 days ago or whatever. It was a, a, a less than a couple of weeks ago where version 9.1 was released. And I want you to try to guess, because again, I got this feedback from people saying like, well, I hear you that you're saying that the extended, you know, end date, extended support or whatever for the life cycle of 8.2, a.k.a. the first version of Dynamics 365 was in 2026. But what about the latest and greatest version 9, version 9.1, actually, which was just released on June 7th, 2021? What do you think the end date is for that? Well, if you said 
January 13th of 2026, which is what we talked about being the already short end of date for the 8.2 version, the first version of Dynamics 365, you will be 100% right. So even with the latest and greatest version of on-prem, which is 9.1, less than two weeks old, Microsoft still saying that the end date for extended support for this latest and greatest version is January 13th, 2026. So I think that the more we look into this, the more I am convinced that you should really, really pay attention to that date being the end of CRM on-premise or Dynamics 365 on-premise. Now, I don't know if when the 9.2 version comes out, again, they're just pushing it to online. So, or they just push it to online and they're still pushing updates and stuff. Whenever 9.2 comes out, maybe, I, I wouldn't hold my breath for this. I'm just going to say that. Maybe the extended end date for 9.2 will magically change to 2030 or something like that. I don't think so. You know, if you think about the, even the original release of version nine, the original release of version nine was in 2018, late 2018, maybe early 2019. But, you know, the official date is October 31st of 2018. If you follow the same life cycle from that, you would say that the extended end day should be, you know, at the end of 2028, if not early 2029. But that's not the case. It's early 2026. So that's three years shorter. That's seven years total rather than the normal 10 that they're doing for, you know, Dynamics 365 9.0. And again, 9.1 comes out and he doesn't extend that. It doesn't change anything. It just says... January 13th, 2026 is not even five years, right? From the 9.1 version. 9.1 version is coming out in June of 2021 and it expires in January of 2026. It's less than five years. It's four and a half years. So, I mean, I don't know how else Microsoft can tell you without really telling you that you should probably think about making a transition. Here's another thing that people overlooked that I'm surprised that people didn't catch this. Do you guys know the software assurance is no longer available for Dynamics starting on January of 2022? So like till the end of this year, you have software assurance available to Dynamics 365 on-premise. After that is gone. Now, can you still buy on-premise licenses for Dynamics, um, starting in 2022, yes, you can do that. It's just not part of your software assurance program. You can buy software assurance for other products. You can still get it for SQL and Exchange and your servers, no problem, but not for Dynamics. And you won't also be able to buy licenses from Microsoft either for Dynamics 365. It's just not part of software assurance anymore. Microsoft is not going to sell it anymore directly to customers. They want you to work with cloud solution providers like us, like Elevate, or like thousands and thousands of partners out there, right? So they're saying, I know that you've been buying software assurance from us. I know that we've been selling you these Dynamics 365 on-premise licenses. We're stopping. We're not doing that anymore by the end of the year. So until December 31st of 2021, you can buy licenses and software assurance from Microsoft. Now, Microsoft has said that if you buy this year, for example, or last year or whatever, software assurance are multi-year agreements, which we talked about in detail, you know, how they kind of trap you into on-prem and you can't really leverage that. Whatever money you paid for that, you can't really leverage that to go online. But they're multi-year agreements. And what Microsoft is saying is that if your agreement ends in 2022, 2023, whatever, based on the agreement and when it started, they will honor it. They will, you know, continue your software assurance, the benefits that you get via software assurance for Dynamics 365. Now we should probably talk about those benefits. I don't specialize anymore on Dynamics 365 on-prem, to be honest. It's not like I can talk at length about 
all of the benefits of software assurance. But what I can tell you is that there's not a whole lot of them. There's not a whole lot of business uh, benefits when it comes to software assurance. Actually, Microsoft says there's not a whole lot of benefits when it comes to software assurance benefits for Dynamics 365 on-prem. They actually have a table of calculating, you know, with points, the benefits of having software assurance if you're using that product. I'll give you an example. If you're using SQL Server Data Center Edition, okay, if you have your own data center running SQL Server Data Center Edition and you have software assurance, based on a bunch of criteria that include things like 24-7 problem resolution support, um, you know, available uh, uh, help for you, you know, anything that has to do, and there's a lot more, right, when it comes to servers, when it comes to license mobility, when it comes to virtualization rights, there's a bunch of, you know, different things. But anyway, they graded all of these benefits that you get from software assurance. And in a scale from zero to 100, basically, having SQL Server Data Center Edition protected on their software assurance has a score of 75 points out of 100. So it makes sense. There's a lot of benefits to having software assurance if you have SQL Server Data Center Edition on-prem and you're running your own SQL Server data centers. So total, totally makes sense. The Enterprise Edition loses some benefits, 50 points. Windows Server, for example, has also its own points. So if you think about having SQL scoring 75, 50, right? Points when it comes to value. Imagine that Dynamics 365 on premise scores two, two points. And this is Microsoft scoring this. This is not some independent guy that just works for Salesforce and he wants to expose how lacking the benefits are from, from SQL assurance, from uh, software assurance. No, no. This is Microsoft running their, you know, looking at the benefits and saying, yeah, I'm going to give it two points. And I think two points is, it's, a, I mean, it's an, a little bit of an exaggeration. And the reason for that is because when you look at the benefits of software assurance for Dynamics, really the only thing that is applicable today is the fact that you have access to new versions, like upgrades and patches and stuff like that. They come up with 9.1, you get it. If you're paying software assurance, it's included. You get 9.2, perfect. You can keep upgrading that version that's included on it. Other than that, that's it. Like I, I, There's nothing else. They used to have something called Dynamics Customer Source, retired in February of this year, gone. They used to have training vouchers, retired, gone. They got rid of them. They used to have like really cool training content through the customer source, you know, that was exclusive for customers that were paying that, you know, in some cases, millions of dollars to Microsoft gone. They all got rid of all that stuff. Why? Because they were replaced by docs.microsoft.com. So if you need, if you have any training needs, if you have any support needs, if you want to look at some, you know, documentation, everything is on docs.microsoft.com. You don't go to customer source anymore. That used to be a benefit of having software assurance for on-prem. Now that's not even a benefit anymore. So I think that Microsoft is getting rid of it mainly because they, they looked at it and they're like, well, we can't charge people hundreds of thousands of dollars and all we're giving them is like the latest and greatest version of Dynamics. I think that was even too much for Microsoft to bear. It was like, no, like we, we can't do this. It doesn't make sense. So the fact that software assurance is going away doesn't necessarily surprise me. It was kind of useless, to be honest, for Dynamics. I understand that it's great for Exchange and SQL and, you know, whatnot. Like if you have some of those products, like I'll give you some examples, right? If you have... You know, if you have Exchange, for example, and you have software assurance, you can have, you know, you can listen to your voicemail from Outlook, right? That is a, a little piece of functionality that is normally not available, but you get it if you have software assurance. You know, you have 
roaming user rights if you're using Office. If you're using servers, you have things about disaster recovery rights, self-hosted applications where you can have your own your own stuff. You have a higher tier of problem resolution support. You're having issues, you get escalated tremendously. But now Microsoft is saying because you're going to buy your licenses from a CSP, you should get support from your CSP as well. And that wouldn't be a challenge if you're using a CSP that is reputable, right? For our customers, for example, that are getting our licenses from us, our dy the Dynamics licenses from us, if they have a Dynamics CRM or 365, I guess, issue, they would come to us. And that's what we do for a living. That's fine. And hundreds or thousands of partners out there that are Dynamics partners and also CSPs will be fine too, supporting Dynamics. But what I see the most, at least for me, maybe this is not the case for everyone else, but at least for me, when I work with customers that are already using a CSP for their Office 365 or their whatever it is, Azure, whatever, that CSP more than likely has no experience with Dynamics. Zero. Like in a lot of cases, we just walk them through it. Look, there's no money really to be made as a custom uh, as a cloud solution provider like we i i cannot remember the last time that we got a customer and maybe we're doing this wrong um so if you if you run your own practice just don't listen to this part but when we get a new customer and they already have a csp to make it easy we just tell them to stay with that csp we don't move them to us that's always an option and we tell our customer look if you want us to charge you so we can pay microsoft the you know the money that you're paying us fine, we'll do that, right? You can go through our system and our portal and you know we've invested a lot of money on having great tools for that. But if you're already happy with a CSP that you have, you know, and they're, you already have a mechanism where you're paying them and they're paying Microsoft, then just stay with them. There's no point on migrating with us, right? At least for your licensing, because there's really no money to be made, especially when you focus on lower licensing tiers like we do. We like to do Power App implementations, not necessarily full price dynamics, especially now that when you look at a price like for, you know, until the end of this month, $3 per user per month. So how much margin do you think a business, a CSP is going to get out of a $3 a month license? I mean, nothing, there's no money to be made, seriously. So because of that, you know, now Microsoft is pushing support to CSPs is saying you guys do the support. The vast majority of CSPs out there have no Dynamics experience, even though there's a lot of companies out there and partners that do have it, but the vast majority of CSPs don't have it, right? So I think this is going to be a, a bit of a mess, to be honest, coming 2022, because support is gone for a lot of customers. Microsoft's not going to do that anymore. Now, if you're a massive company, if you have one of those super large implementations, you're already working with Microsoft directly. You know, I remember that the leadership of Microsoft, you know, when I, whenever I talk to whoever is in charge of Dynamics and, and ask them for, you know, stories or what, what they have been up to, you know, kind of tell me a day, a day of uh, on the life of the VP of business solutions or whatever. It always involved visiting like big customers. They go in person, they meet with them. They, they are basically their customer success managers for lack of better terms. What can I do to make sure that you're getting the most out of dynamics? These guys, the higher VPs and whatnot. Um, so yeah, if you're one of those companies, you're probably going to get support from Microsoft. You have nothing to be afraid of. But out of the tens of thousands of customers out there that are using CRM on-premise, how many of those do you think qualify for that level of having a higher up at Microsoft visit your company? I would say the vast majority don't qualify for that. So I think it's going to be a bit of a mess in 2022. That's just my opinion. Uh, they're not moving the dates. They are getting rid of stuff. And I think what I want to do to wrap up this episode, and I don't want it to be super long, especially if you're listening to this on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. Uh, but, you know, just listen to it later. Stop it. Listen to it later. Um, because what I want to do is I want to talk about what has been happening at Microsoft since 2010. Actually, let's go a little bit back to 2000. 
All right. Let's go a little bit back to 2000 because what happened in 2000, you know, if you if you think about the the history of Dynamics is Microsoft Dynamics as a as a brand or however you want to call it um, started back in the day. I mean, it started before the year 2000. Um, I think that the biggest move that they made was they acquire a company in Fargo called Great Plains. Okay. Um, that was in 2000, 2001. Great Plains was acquired by Microsoft for $1.1 billion. And by the time they acquired Great Plains, they actually had a couple of other products that did kind of the same thing, their ERP system, um, however you want to call it. They had, you know, they have uh, GP. I don't know if you're, well, Great Plains, you're, they had SL or Salomon, I think it was SL, and they have NAF or Navision, right? Now, again, all of these were like this little companies that Microsoft acquired, and they, I don't know if you've ever heard of, Project Green, but they had an idea to kind of mix and match them. And I have several articles that I pulled. I, I did kind of, um, you know, just looking around um, and and pull a bunch of different articles. And I'll, I'll be reading from some of these because I think they've done a great job putting this together. Um, so let's talk about, you know, kind of the consolidation of all of these different different companies. So Here's uh, the article. This was written. I don't know who wrote this. Let me see if I can find Nicola Wright. Um, it's um, it's a really cool article talking about the history of dynamics. Um, and he goes way back. Like I started reading this article. He's talking like in, in 1984, blah, blah, blah. Like I, I'm skipping all over the 80s, let's just say, um, and go back to, to the business solution division. So here's what happened. So Microsoft acquires... Uh, GP, Great Plain Software, in 2001, and they bring in the CEO of um, of Great Plains. His name is Doc Bergham. All right, so Doc Bergham comes in. He starts to run the basically the business solutions, Microsoft Business Solutions division at Microsoft. Now, this solution was actually created before. Microsoft Dynamics CRM even existed, which by the way, and we haven't gotten there, but that, that wasn't the original name of it. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. This is just more interesting for people that like kind of the history of it. All right. So uh, to the article. So it says, for the first few years, Microsoft continued to turn out updated versions of its newly acquired programs, adding role-based interfaces, SQL-based reporting, and SharePoint and Office integrations. In the early 2000s, Microsoft released the first versions of the applications to be fully branded as Microsoft products. So again, they bought Accepta, they bought Great Plains, they bought Salomon, they bought you know all these companies, and they you know, for the first time released the early 2000s under the leadership of Doug Burgum, they decided to release these branded as Microsoft Dynamics. So the first Dynamics products were actually ERP products. They weren't CRM products. All right. So um, Microsoft Business Solutions Accepta rolled out in 2002. Navision uh, and the iCommunicate.net based Microsoft Business Solutions customer relationship management was in 2003. So um, in uh, in 2002, they released Accepta. And then in 2003, they released um, Navision or NAV and CRM. And then they follow that with Great Plains in 2004. So they had all of these products out there at the same time. Um, here's a funny quote that I, I, it caught my eye. I almost skipped this whole article, but as soon as I saw the name Leon tribe, I'm like, I, wait, this article is good. I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, but this is Leon has a quote in this article. He says he's, by the way, Leon has been on the show. He's a Microsoft MVP. Love that guy. Um, so let me, uh, let's just talk about what he said. He said, in January of 2003, I was invited to attend a four-day training session on a new product Microsoft was releasing to the market, still in beta. It was called Microsoft CRM. 
While the product was functionally far from its competitors, it was clear to me there was a solid foundation from which a great product would emerge. And that's what Leon said. Apparently, he attended the very first ever Dynamic, well, not Dynamics, just Microsoft CRM. It wasn't even called Dynamics back in the day. And actually, I saw somewhere else. I pulled the history. Let me see if I can find it. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, it was just called Microsoft Business Solutions Customer Relationship Management 1.0. Like that was the full name of it. So think about that. Okay, guys, we came up with a new product in early 2003. Uh, what's the name of it? Um, it's the Microsoft Business Solutions Customer Relation Management 1.0. And we want to run the first training session ever. And Leon, you're invited. How OG is that? The Leon was in that class. That's awesome. Love it. I love that story. That's why I had to, I had to bring it up. Um, obviously, that version 1.0 was then updated to 1.2. And it just didn't get much traction, right? Nothing really happened until 2005, and it was late in 2005, when Microsoft released Dynamics 3.0. So 2.0 never existed. It just went from 1.0 to 1.2 to 3.0. So like our new like inside joke, if anyone asks you when you started working with Dynamics, just say you started with version 2. And... Uh, People listen to the show will be like, ah, you listen to the podcast? Yeah, all right, cool. So they'll, they'll be in on the joke. If not, they'll be impressed. They'll be like, oh, wow, version two. I didn't even hear of that. You'll be like, yeah, that was uh, special ops. You know, it was classified. And I was I was involved with that one. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, 3.0 came out. Uh, that's when I started working with Dynamics. That was in 2005, December of 2005. I started working with uh, Dynamics 3.0. I think it was around February or March of 2006. That's when I started working with it. The company I was with wanted to install it. That, and um, I was tasked with doing that. And then later on, um, Dynamics 4.0 came out, which is when they finally you know, hit it. That, that's when they hit it uh, big time. I saw an, another quote. Um, from, let me see if I can find it, uh, which I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. Uh, another one of those back in the day quotes, oh man, I got to find it for you guys. So you can, you can hear this. Um, but, um, anyway, it's a quote from Bill Patterson who was, you know, on the very early, I guess, you know, uh, very early launches of, of dynamic CRM basically, and uh, Bill Patterson was like destroying Salesforce. He was like, you know, we're killing them. You know, they got nothing against us they, or they got nothing to compete with us. We're the best, blah, blah, blah. And he now works for Salesforce, which is I, I just thought it was it was pretty funny um, that, um, you know, I, I got that, that quote from him. But, yeah, he is the. The executive vice president, vice president, general manager of CRM applications at Salesforce right now. But anyway, this is from back in the day. I found the quote. It's a quote from Bill Patterson. It says, we're seeing a lot of people switching from Salesforce.com. And this is when CRM Online launched. All right. So we're going to fast forward a little bit uh, into 2008. CRM Online just launched. And Bill was interviewed about this. Uh, they, he said, I mean, man, it would have been awesome to be you know, at Microsoft when, when this went live, but he said 500 plus customers were at that point using the online version on a trial basis. And I'm going to hit you with some of the facts back in the day. And this is the, really the only reason why I wanted to talk about this article because I thought it was, it was kind of cool. And he brought that, um, you know, nostalgia from back in the day. Um, anyway, so at that point, it has been beta testing for six months. They launched 500 plus customers are on trial and they asked Bill, well, how do you how do you feel about this? Where is this going? So Mike, he says, Microsoft intends, intends to play competitive uh, hardball with Salesforce. We're pricing the professional edition back in the day, professional edition of Dynamic CRM online with five gigs of data storage. 100 configurable workflows and 100 custom entities at $39 per user per month through 20, uh, 2008. So in 2008, when they launched, it was $39 a month for everything. Um, I love the fact that 
they have the the limits in workflows and custom amenities. Like right now, I just feel like you blow, f you know, by these numbers, like on almost every like decent project, you 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 blow by it. Um, so yeah, so five gigs of data and 100 workflows and 100 custom amenities, thirty nine dollars per user per month. And then in 2009, they were going to increase it to forty four dollars per user per month. And then they said the professional edition plus which I've never heard of until I read this article. I don't even remember this thing. And again, this was very early when CRM launched, so I'm sure they changed their mind. They do that a lot. Um, 20 gigs of storage, 200 configurable workflows, 200 custom entities, $59 per user per month. I don't remember this. Um, I don't think this ever launched. And if it did, please, one of you uh, OGs, maybe Leon can help me out here. Um, although he probably wasn't aware of this back in the day because this launched in the U.S. only for like the first two years. Um, I think until 2010 or 2011, this wasn't available anywhere else but the U.S. Um, so, yeah, I don't remember a professional editions plus. I think they got rid of that. I do remember the $44 a month. Um, I think that's when I started working with online. I never saw the 39. Um, when I started working with it, it was 44 and it stayed at 44 for a couple of years. Um, then it says Salesforce prices start at $20 per user per month for a group edition uh, of its on-demand CRM application. I don't even know what on-demand means. Is that online? I don't know. Um, CRM application, it has to be online because Salesforce was never on-prem as far as I know. And $65 per user per month for the full featured application. So that's when they were competing 44 against 65. I do remember those days. Um, Patterson says software as a service competitors like Salesforce and NetSuite charge much more than Microsoft for data storage. That is true, by the way. That's still true to this day. Um, these are in trivial amount for a business that just wants to get started on a CRM system. Of course, that was the idea. It was to go online because, you know, for companies out there like the Delta Airlines of the world, or like if you're, if you're a massive company, yes, of course, you can afford to pay millions of dollars to have your own custom made CRM system. But Outside of that, it's you know small companies also need a CRM system and they cannot afford to have one custom built for them from scratch. So I I do agree with old Bill uh, when he was at Microsoft that you know companies want to get started quick, they want to customize some stuff, and they just don't have the money to you know pay a lot of money for storage. Like I remember, for example, uh, when I started working with Dynamics for an extra gig of storage. Per month, Microsoft would charge ten dollars. I think it was nine ninety nine uh, per gig per month, and Salesforce charged two hundred. I mean, it was huge. It was twenty times more. It wasn't like even close. So, I definitely remember Salesforce always being um, very ex very expensive. Um, I love you know. There's just a lot more information in this in this uh, article. Like for example, they're talking about um, you know Microsoft had trained 150 solution providers to work with Dynamics CRM online. Like they grabbed 150 partners and trained them all. And then they said, you know, we, we just want to you to work with these companies out there and then more people will learn about it. Um, and um, it also has some old school Mark Benioff, you know, um, this of Microsoft, which he does a lot. But anyway, they asked Mark Benioff what he thought of the Microsoft announcement that, you know, they were they were coming online and, you know, the prices and all that stuff. And he was like, haven't they announced that like five times already? Like, are they still launch? What's going on? Like he acted all confused. And that's, you know, typical fashion of Mark Benioff, who, by the way, I've invited multiple times to be on this show, uh, but he's always busy. Apparently he reads a response. He follows me on Twitter. Um, so I, you know, direct message him and I invited him to the show multiple times. Like, Hey Mark, whenever you want, anytime in person, remote, however you want. And uh, he's always, well, I'm preparing for this. I'm, you know, working on that. I have, you know, to put up some fires. There's always something. Um, but, uh, why would he come in this show? Like, <laughs> that's what I, I don't even know why he responds to my direct messages, but you know, he still follows me. So that's kind of interesting. Um, now, Here's what I'm going to try to wrap it all up into one. And this is why I wanted this episode to be titled The Father of Dynamics CRM Online. 
And that's because I really, really believe that Satya Nadella, the current CEO of Microsoft, is really the father of Dynamics, uh, at least the online version. And I'm going to just share a few things that I've learned about Satya, you know, over the time, you know, since he took over Microsoft and why I think we see some of these moves for easier adoption and work with, you know, with uh, the power platform, with with some of these tools that are online. But um, basically, you know, I if you look at his trajectory, if you look at his history within Microsoft, you can see where things are going. You don't have to be an expert or you know predict the future to see what's what's happening. So let's look at the facts and the evidence together and figure out if the case for the end of on-premise is a strong one or not. So the first time I saw Satya like speaking, basically, at an event, um, it was about, I don't know, a year and a half after he took over as a CEO. Um, you know, from, you know, from Steve Ballmer, uh, was back in the day. And I'm trying to look at a quote that I pull from that conversation because, um, I thought it was, I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, the quote, if I can find it, I don't know where it is. I don't know what I did with it. I have so many tabs open <laughs> trying to put together this episode because there's, there's just a lot out there, um, for, you know, to, to analyze when it comes to Satya, when it comes to the history you know, of all this stuff and whatnot. But um, anyway, Satya uh, spoke at a conference in Toronto. It was the, I, I think it was, I'm trying to remember. It was the, oh, I said like the World Partner Conference, I guess it was back in the day. I mean, it's, 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 it's been a while. Um, and I think, let me see if I, if this is the article right here. Yep. So the Worldwide Partner Conference in Toronto, it was in 2016. And I remember, you know, because he was, you know, obviously the featured speaker, he just took over very recently uh, as the CEO of Microsoft. And here's the here's the quote that he mentioned, you know, during that whole speech and I guess keynote, right? Quote, I dreamed of doing things for our customers and partners that are now only possible because of the widespread adoption of the cloud, proliferation of data, devices and sensors, and agile development environments. That's what he said. Now, again, he said this in the past, like I used to dream of doing things for our customers like this, but are now possible only because of the cloud, the proliferation of data, pro proliferation of devices, sensors, agile development environments. Like this is what he used to dream about. And when you look at the history of Satya at Microsoft, he actually took over the business application, the business solutions division at Microsoft from the guy that we were talking about earlier, Doc Burgum, who was the CEO of Great Plains. So he went to Microsoft and started leading the business applications, sorry, the business solution, I keep calling it business applications, the Microsoft business solutions division. And he was replaced by Satya, I think he was, in 2004 or something like that, uh, in 2006, actually, was when he was replaced uh, by, by Satya. Satya used to be the, basically, the, the um, he was responsible for Microsoft research and development globally, right? So he was paid, literally, to innovate. That's what he was paid to do for five years. He was doing that before he took over the seat from Doug Burgum. Doug Burgum at Microsoft on the Business Solutions Division. Fun fact about Doug Burgum, he is actually now currently the governor of North Dakota. Huh, who knew? Just learning about, you know, Satya led me to this guy and I was just reading about it and I'm like, okay, so he basically took all his millions of dollars and decided to become a politician. And right now he's the governor of North Dakota, which is one of the states here in the United States. Hmm. Interesting, fun fact. But anyway, Satya took over that whole division 
And there's a whole interview. It's available on Microsoft. It's from September 12th of 2006. And they're basically talking about why was Satya selected? He was just doing R&D. What, like, what makes him qualified to lead the business solutions division? Now, obviously, right now he's the CEO. So in retrospect, we just laugh about the fact that people doubted this. But back in 2006, Satya was basically a developer. Like he was innovating. He was coming up with new technologies. Why business solutions? So here's a, um, you know, here's a, a, an interesting question, a Q&A basically with Jeff, uh, who was the, the division president uh, for Microsoft Business and Jeff Rakes, I think is his name. They talk about, you know, how will Satya fit in the team and you know, why he's going to lead this thing. The question is this. Why was Satya Nadella chosen after an extensive internal and external search for a new leader for the Microsoft Business Solutions division? So Jeff Rake says, after conducting an exhaustive, exhaust, bleh, I always struggle with this word, exhaustive search for the right candidate, Doug and I ultimately realized that one of our own internal candidates who we recognize as a top contender at the very beginning of the process was and is the strongest candidate for the job. That person is Satya Nadella. Satya has been instrumental to uh, in partnering with Doug and the MBS leadership team to drive growth in this critical business for Microsoft. He has proven talents in leading an R&D team located across the world in Copenhagen, Fargo, Hyderabad, and Redmond. He has relentless focus on our customers and partners and their unique needs. Now, again, there's a ton of you know, achievements that Satya brought to the table leading R&D. But listen to what was listed as the reason why he was selected to lead the business solution. And I quote again, Jeff, Satya's contributions are too long to list. So I will highlight the ones that I consider to be breakthrough or the breakthrough contributions he has made with Microsoft Dynamics. Since 2001, remember what happened in 2001, right? When they launched Dynamics, basically, in that whole division. Satya has shipped 10 major software releases spanning Dynamics ERP, CRM, and Office small business product lines. He is also the architect of the group's innovative or innovative Wave 1s and 2 Dynamics product roadmap strategy, delivering Wave 1 commitments to focus on the role-based experience, the portal, and collaboration capabilities, SQL, and office-based business intelligence, and easy integration via web services throughout current Microsoft Dynamics to the Microsoft Dynamics product line. Satya and his team are readying Dynamics Wave 2, which will focus on taking the core business logic and make it model driven and bringing it together the best functionality across the product lines. So as you see, I'm quite excited about Satya's assuming the leadership position uh, for Microsoft Dynamics as we continue to drive our core vision and take the business into the next uh, stage of growth and innovation. So anyway, Satya was really leading the team that created dynamic crm right the first the very first version of dynamic crm and the second version that doesn't exist and the third version etc etc until he took over in 2006 by 2006 we had crm4 all of that came from satya right when he took over 2006 he was working on something called dynamic crm live Right, all of this is on the article from Microsoft, Dynamic CRM Live, which became two years later Microsoft Dynamic CRM Online. So he actually, or his team, he, under his leadership, created Dynamic CRM Online. He wanted to move everything to the cloud. So much he was so kind of focused on moving everything to the cloud that in two thousand and uh, 2010, no, sorry, in 2007, just a year later, he got another job. He was then named from VP of Business Division. He was then named, or I guess promoted, to Senior VP of Research and Development for the Online Services Division, in addition to running the 
business services division. So he was doing all of that, right? And he took that unit and pushed everything to the cloud. He brought SQL to the cloud, Windows Server to the cloud, the developer tools that you enjoy in Azure. All of that was moved by Satya's team. That whole team from 2011, it was like, it was like nothing when he took over in 2007. He started building data centers and pushing everything to the cloud. Only six years later, by 2013, they had a revenue of $16.6 billion, right? In, sorry, in 2011, they had $16.6 billion. Two years later, $20 billion by 2013. And of course, in 2014, he took over as, as the CEO of the company. So from the time he took over as a senior VP of research and development until he became CEO, his whole focus, he was adamant about moving stuff to the cloud. That's all he was doing. He's responsible for bringing, like I said, SQL, all of Windows servers to the cloud, developer tools to the cloud. And as I mentioned on that quote earlier from that conference and that, you know, um, keynote that he did in, in 2016, he mentioned that his dream has always been to move everyone, every business out there into a platform that is safe and easy to work with and easy to develop. All right. And I cannot think of a better way to describe the power platform than Satya's dream and Satya's vision. So when the CEO of the company has spent basically the vast majority of his career at Microsoft innovating and figuring out ways to move things to the cloud, like they just opened a data center in Arizona, like they are just growing. They're bigger than Google and Amazon and all these guys combined. The Microsoft cloud continues to grow and is continued to be led by someone who is obsessed, literally obsessed with pushing everything online. So I think when we look at all of the evidence and we look at who basically is the father of dynamic CRM and CRM online, I think that we can all agree that the future of Dynamics 365 is online. And I don't know if there's any future for dynamic CRM on-prem. I I honestly have no idea. I There's nothing in Satya, like nothing that I've read about Satya, and you can do your own research, of course, has anything where he says, oh, we're investing on this on-prem technology of some kind. Just insert any technology in here. Everything is online. Everything that he's doing. So I don't know. I, I felt like this would be an interesting episode so we can talk about, um, you know, what's out there, what, what's the evidence, basically what, um, what I've seen and based on the feedback and based on you know, all of the information that is out there, um, this would be a good time for on-premise customers to really, really start thinking about making the move, especially if you have a contract, for example, on their software assurance that is going to expire this year or that is going to expire next year, right? It's not going to be there for you to renew anymore. Whatever contract you have, like I can only imagine a customer right now that is on-prem that has a software assurance contract that ends, let's say, February of 2022. I mean, you're about to get rattled because everything is going to change basically on, on how you're consuming Dynamics 365, how you're supporting Dynamics 365, all of that, it's going to change. You're going to have to work with customers, uh, sorry, with partners that are CSPs, that are cloud solution providers. Everything will be cloud-based, and this is why this is the right time to make a move into Dynamics 365 online and the Power Platform. I mean, I don't know what else. Can come. I mean, unless Satya himself says, Gus, I agree. People should move before it's too late. 
Um, I don't know what else, what other you know evidence we can have to essentially prove that this is the right time to make a move. Uh, that it, you know this it's urgent basically um, at this point. And by the way, I have invited Satya several times. I uh, you know I have his email address, which I assume he doesn't check. It's some secretary or something. I've emailed several times, you know, asking him because fun fact, and I don't know if I'm allowed to share this information or not, but whatever. Um, I don't think it's NDA. Um, when we do the MVP summit in Redmond, when we used to be in person back in the day in 2019 or whatever, um, our, when you go to the MVP summit, you have thousands of MVPs from all over the world, from all the different products come together to Redmond to have sessions with the product team, right? The leadership, uh, the leadership of the team and, you know, basically understand what they're working on and get feedback from us and all of that stuff. That's what the MVP summit is about in a nutshell. Professionally, that's what it's about. And for the last, I think, two or three years, I don't remember exactly. I For sure two, but I don't know if it's three. The MVP summit for us, for the Dynamics CRM or Dynamics 365 division or MVPs, let's just say, has been in the same building where Satya's office is which is pretty cool. Now, it is cool and not cool because, number one, can't tell you where it is. Uh, it's it's a secret. Uh, you can become an MVP and then you can go there. Um, can Cannot take... We don't have any pictures or videos or anything from that building. It's prohibited. Whereas other MVPs can take pictures in front of buildings and, oh, this is cool. I'm at the Microsoft building where they make exchange, where they make whatever. That is really cool. We can't do that. Um, Dynamics 365 MVPs are kind of odd like that. You won't see any pictures of us. I think the pictures that we took, we actually had to all walk. Like I have video of this, of us walking through the Microsoft campus in Redmond, like two or three blocks away from the building where we were at because it's a secret location. It's like an unmarked building. It's like, I don't know, I'm going to make something up. It's like building 60. You know, it's not 60. It's just a number. But there, it doesn't say, like, leadership building. There's no sign. on. You cannot tell where the office of the CEO is. Um, so, anyway, our sessions, and as far as I understand, we're the only group that have sessions in this building, is in the same building, literally under Satya's office, right? Um, I've seen him multiple times uh, when we're at the MVP Summit, coming and going, leaving the office, whatever. I've seen other, you know, leaders like Brad Anderson, for example. I've seen, you know, some of the leadership of Microsoft going in and out for meetings and stuff, uh, which is pretty cool. And I don't know if this is a just a coincidence, but I think it's pretty cool that when it comes to that time of the year where the best and brightest, and I'm not including myself on that group, even though I happen to be an MVP, I'm, t I'm talking about my other friends. They are the best and brightest. Um, they get to converge once a year. And again, let's skip COVID, uh, COVID, but they get to converge once a year and literally drive the innovation and, and push Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform to the next stage. And I can't imagine of a better fit for that to be happening that right under the office of the person who started all. So I just think that's a cool thing. And I, I wish more of you guys listening to this show would get to experience that. I know that some of you listening to this um, have experienced that with me and you know you, you actually think it's, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, but um, yeah, um, thank you so much guys for for tuning in. Happy Father's Day to everyone. I want to dedicate this episode to Jonas Rapp, who it's, you know, basically having some issues, health issues. And this is public information. He had a stroke back on February 17th, I believe, and he's recovering from it. Jonas is, you know, one of my favorite people in the whole world. Um, he's awesome. And, um, I, you know, I just, I just hope he, he keeps getting better. Um, sorry. <clears throat> Anyway, dedicated to Jonas. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks.